It's my very great pleasure to bring to bring today's very exciting events to a sort of culmination in our keynote. Uh, I'm going to introduce to you Philip Narowski, whose name you have heard many times. I gave a very brief and nonetheless too long comment earlier about how uh, our absent and not well colleague and friend from Boundaries with Wad Gunzich and I uh, came to the seemingly inevitable conclusion that if we really wanted to advance our understanding of the formations that we call neoliberalism in some way as a key for uh, understanding how the present moment came to be formed, it was essential that we talk to Murawski. I had an email from Gazich the other day saying, who's very, as I said, very ill, saying, one thing that makes me really angry is that I'm not there uh, to ask hard questions. <laughs> Phil Murawski is the Carly Coke. Coke? Yeah, Coke. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a cousin. <laughs> I was prepared to say something. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to defend it. Uh, professor of economics and policy studies and the history and philosophy of science as well as acting director of the Riley Center for Science, Technology and Values at Notre Dame University. Uh, he's the author of more than a half a dozen books and the editor of at least an equal number of collections. Uh, he's published, speaking of digital and factual information, what seems to me my best non-algorithmic sense to be innumerable papers, <laughs> articles, and reviews. Um, to continue the narrative, he's made several appearances on TV. And I had not met Phil Moraski until yesterday, but as I said to him in the lobby of the Wyndham Hotel, oh, I have the advantage, I've seen you on TV. So, uh, his was a major voice in the New York Review of Books conference on who and what are economics, economists from 2015, which is uh, a conference that I've noticed has had a very long life on Vimeo and is very much worth uh, reviewing. Phil Borowski has been a fellow at All Souls College, Oxford, a senior fellow at Duke and in 2011 served as president of the History of Economics Society. His important and influential study of economics as an historically situated mode of knowledge production began with studies of physics as a object jealousy model for economics and the making of economics into what he calls a cyborg science. Perhaps his most profound development of research along these lines, though, lies in his study of the Mount Power and Thought Collective, about which we've already heard some people make comments today, which, I'll make a comment too, which unearths an intellectual effort to provide a dominant ontological, and I think that point's very pertinent in Morawski's work, a dominant ontological and political model for the organization of society through the purpose of control of what we used to call political economy. Murawski has brought together deep historical study, thorough philosophical investigation of the ontological prejudices and dispositions of Mount Power, and an account of the evolving thought collective's efficacy in general and of this neoliberal project in particular. He has continued to expand the scope of the project and this investigation, widening and deepening the concept of neoliberalism to match his own, its own expansion and idea. Thomas Hobbes once wrote, and I'm now quoting, Thomas Hobbes once wrote, hell is truth, hell is truth seem to me. And this is the quotation from Murawski. It is a neoliberal tactic to postpone the truth as long as possible when it comes to the nature of the society they are dedicated to bring about, at least because human rationality is thought to be incapable of comprehending the truth con concerning the, and this is in capital letters, the truth concerning the final reckoning. In today's keynote address in the shade of recent elections and the current efforts to adult, uh, alter, if you will, or adapt the state, as you see, he invokes the, the Hobbes' Leviathan with his title and so will speak to us today on 
Hell's Truth, C2A. Please welcome Fulton. thank Paul for this wonderful experience of actually having people read your stuff and <laughs> do stuff with it. And then, you know, God, that doesn't happen very often. So uh, uh, it's been amazing so far, and I, I look forward to, to tomorrow as well. And uh, when I was thinking about this, I didn't know how deeply into the history should I go, and um, especially because of the breadth of the audience and so forth. And so I thought rather, um, that I would talk, or start off talking, about something that I'm sure some of you noticed too, is the number of people, especially on the left, who insist that neoliberalism isn't real or doesn't exist, or somebody, usually my mirage in my mind, or something like that, um, and uh, try to meditate as to why that's so. Um, and my main argument today, just so that you, you know, if you need to leave early, is basically that uh, the left doesn't want to see neoliberalism as a philosophical project. They want to see it as, you know, uh, doing good work for the rich and all that, you know, all the things which clearly it is. But um, they don't want to see it as a philosophical project, and that leads them astray. Uh, and that really is what ties together. Uh, the, the examples that I'll develop in today. Um, first off, I want to show that uh, we need to stare their vision of truth in the face and see what it really, really looks like, okay, um, and where it comes from. Then uh, I want to speculate a bit, although I know people in the audience here won't like this part, so I'll go fast. Um, <laughs> that, that Marxists are especially vulnerable to this, for intellectual reasons. And then, you know, we'll, we'll push that aside and do some more fun stuff about, uh, uh, I want to show you that modern discussions of fake news and open science, which sound like two wildly different things, but they aren't, <laughs> um, uh, are, are easily understandable from this precept. Okay, and then, you know, I'll stop probably. But, okay. Um, what are the things that people on the left say about neoliberalism when they disparage it? Well, they say it's a conspiracy theory. Uh, it's too based on ideas. Um, it doesn't fit their notions of how things really work. And I accept that. I mean, it, it does conflict with their notions of how the world works. Um, they also point out that the neoliberals don't call themselves that. Well, as if any political formation adequately identifies it. So, I mean, that one amazes me. You know, you know, go to France and start talking about liberalism and see how far that gets you. You know, I mean, Americans are so confused about these things. But anyway, um, that a lot of people on the left, and I can understand this because, like, you know, who wants to spend their nights even with you know endless containers of Kahlua and stuff like that, reading Hayek. Um, um, the left doesn't have to read their opponents to know what holds their beliefs together. Now this is very important, I'm going to come back to this. That there's a sense in which we already understand them. And so all of this stuff about trying to parse their beliefs is really kind of a waste of time. I, don't, I can't tell you the number of times I've had people say that. Um, and then it is true that even writers from the left who write about neoliberalism don't access the same aspects. And that's true. But, you know, that has to do with my thesis. That is, you know, do some people feel that they can understand it without having to understand its basic philosophical core? And then finally, there are people who, and we've already heard that today, that there's some people, relatively well-known people who say that fascism or populism has resulted in death in neoliberalism. So, I mean, their excuse then is, oh, you may have cared about this before, but now it doesn't really matter. You know, we have Trump and so forth and so on. Okay. I think that's what one hears. Right. <clears throat> I, personally, am going to argue against all those positions. Um, not individually. Course, but I'm willing to, if you want to take me on any one of them. Um, that 
I think even historians, and here I'm thinking of Jennifer Burns or Angus Bergen, and if you've seen those books, uh, or social theorists, don't appreciate the extent to which uh, the neoliberal thought collective is held together primarily by philosophical commitments. I want to be serious about that. That primarily that's how they recognize each other. All right? Insofar, and that's a really important thing because they have to know that they're part of the same political project. And then that's played out as economic and political agendas in their local and temporal context. And that's one of the beauties of um, uh, Mount Pelerin society, is it thought of the world that way. It thought, no, 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 there will be these core doctrines and then you'll go out in a particular country, a particular cultural area, and you know, you'll do the work that's needed to be done to make some of this attractive to the people there. All right? That was the way it was phrased quite early on. Um, and uh, by the way, it's not laissez-faire. I mean, I hope in this audience I don't have to go on and on about that. Okay? This whole belief that it's about laissez-faire is part of the fog. It's an important part of the fog. All right? So, what I'm claiming is that they pledge to some distinct epistemological precepts and not to a crude economic god masquerading as a political god, which is the way I think a lot of people on the left like to think about it. Right? That somehow um, it's really just about economics, <clears throat> but somehow it gets parlayed into <coughs> All right, now, <clears throat> obviously in the time here, <laughs> We're not going to go into great detail about epistemology, so I'm doing a really cornball version of it. But, you know, it gets the point across, I think, adequately well. Um, I've reduced it to four points here. Um, now, again, this is another thing. This, that's why this is not history. Um, I would have to go through a lot of these individuals to point, you know, how much of this do they actually attest themselves to and how much do they kind of back down from. I want, want you to know that I know that this is a generalization across a lot of people who are very good at arguing with each other, okay? But that's what it, I think it's, it really captures a lot of what modern neoliberals believed, and I will do this a little later. It took a while for them to get there, okay? Uh, first, people are sloppy, undependable cognitive agents. Um, I'm glad uh, uh, Frank went before me because Actually, a lot of this is going to speak to what you see as a possible remedy and where that remedy would come from or not. Okay, so uh, they think people are basically dumb. Um, but not to worry, the market is the greatest information processor known to human history. Now, I keep saying this in my stuff, and well, some people in the room luckily have noticed it. But I think most other people just don't, like they pass by that, and they, you know, they want to hear some of the other stuff about the state and things like which is fine. But this is the heart of the doctrine. This is the heart of the matter. This is what makes this crew different from all other crews on the right. Okay. Um, they really believe that the market knows more than any human individual at any time. Now what that means uh, takes a long time to parse out, and I'm not going to do it here because in fact, even Hayek, this is a hint for some of you who are into this, even Hayek over the course of his career changes his tune on how this works twice. Yes. So, please understand, I, you know, I would make this much more complicated if you wish, but for now it's enough to say that they really do in their mind some way think that the market is really always the validator of truth. By the way, this is the uh, Foucault aspect too, that Foucault notices that there has to be a principle of validation of truth. This is it. This is central to the, to the doctrine. Now, the political problem, if you believe this, on to point three, <laughs> is how do you get people to accept that and subordinate themselves to this market? Now, this project is called freedom. <laughs> no, I see. This is one of the great pretzels. <laughs> how this mean? How does that mean? How to subordinate yourself to this sort of hard thing that's hard to see and understand? How is that freedom? Okay. Now, as I say in point four, the politics of one to three can be a little tricky. Let's not be too literal about it. <laughs> no, I'm serious about that too. That. 
Uh, I'm going to talk about that. That there are levels at which you can acknowledge this. And there, and there are different situations in which this can be acknowledged to a certain extent. Let me quickly uh, comment on that list. You can just kind of remember it. There's history behind all of this, as you would imagine. Very interesting history. Uh, the history behind the idea that um, the democratic populace is stupid and untrustworthy well predates them. There's these lovely books in, in history about how back in the 1920s you start getting these arguments between Walter Lippmann and Dewey. By the way, it's no accident that the Lippmann Colloquium becomes the precursor to the Mount Pelerin Society, you see? Yeah, see, this is why, okay? It's because this argument is already happening. This is the tense issue. Um, and, uh, again, I'm just totally writing my shot over history. How did Cold War uh, politi politicians uh, react to this? Not by making people smarter. Frank, I'm talking to you. It's by experts. The Cold War uh, epistemology is that experts will make up for the fact that the populace is undependable epistemologically. Okay. By the way, for those of you who know about any, so this whole thing that one hears economists say, and I don't see any economists in the room, so I can get rid of this. Um, that uh, this whole idea that uh, oh behavioral economics now we understand people better. This is rubbish. I mean, behavioral economics is just the expression of neoliberalism within the context of orth orthodoxy. That's all it is. It just says, duh, people are not rational actors like in the basic neoclassical models. So what? You know. It, so it's all of this is this argument that just keeps rolling. Very important for a um, Now, uh, the second thing about the marketplace of ideas, why has Friedrich Hayek come up so often? Um, it's not because like he's brilliant and the rest of them are, you know, it's not, I don't believe in that kind of stuff. It's that he really is the precursor of the this central mm -hmm. epistemic argument. It's him. Mm -hmm. He's the one who first starts arguing that markets are information processors. They aren't whatever you thought they were. And by the way, I'm going to come back to this because this is important for Marxism too. The argument about epistemology becomes the argument of what a market is. Okay. So that's why Hayek is so important. Now we come to, to uh, the, the third point, which is that basically, you know, freedom <laughs> has to be <laughs> seeing the inevitability of this. Well, even Friedman says, and by the way, Friedman is not at all the best person to read to understand how this works, but in any event, um, Friedman has this quote, businessmen who may be bankrupted if they refuse to face facts are one of the few groups that develop the habit of doing so. Shall I say that again? <laughs> businessmen face facts more than the average person. That is why I have discovered repeatedly the successful businessman is more open to new ideas than the academic intellectual who prides himself on his alleged independence of thought. See, you gotta understand, that's the direct corollary of the market as information processor. That those closest to the market will, in effect, whatever their cognitive deficits, will be brought closer to the actual verification of the truth. And of course, this is also, I hope you know, this is like the three by five argument as to why socialism must fail. They always trot out. You know how that works, right? Um, one, market knows more than any person. Two, planner thinks they know. Um, three, they just come to grief because they're wrong. Socialism must fail. That's it. Okay. So you see that important uh, fight against socialism is, is really derived from the epistemology. Okay. All right, uh, a little bit further commentary on this. There's this problem of how we're going to get pol uh, people to politically sign on to this, right? What this effectively does, and I don't have the time to do this, so you really need to sit down and think about this a little bit, is that this doctrine effectively hives liberty off from autonomy and, of course, Kantian self-determination. Um, they kind of know this. 
I mean, they don't make a big deal of it, but they do talk about it a little bit among themselves. And basically, the, the problem here is that you can't trust people to know if they're really free because they're weak cognizers, undependable, don't really know what's going on, engage in wishful thinking. So they don't know that they're free. So this is why freedom has to get retasked. See? It can't be free to be you and me or John Stuart Mill or any of that kind of stuff. It can't be that. So, in that case, what's education? Education is not a prerequisite for a democratic citizenry because, in a sense, it's a waste. No, so I want you to see that. Let's, look at, let's stare at what they really think. It's a waste. Basically, education is just lumps of human capital. And then, of course, the very idea of human capital gets rid of the notion of labor. I'll come back to that with Marxism. You, you know, Marxists should understand that, that this stuff is, is dedicated to dissolving Marxism from within. And this is the beginning of how it's done. Now, of course, as I've just pointed out to you, only entrepreneurs live fully realized lives. You already heard Milton Friedman say that. Everyone else are just drones. You think I'm being harsh? But, I mean, let's, let's be clear about their dark view of humanity. All right. But of course, you, you know, can you tell people this? <laughs> hey drones! <laughs> How you doing? Um, so, um, truth therefore becomes unmoored from argumentation. And see, they have actually thought a little bit about this. I'm not saying like they say it is all of these, I'm saying it, they have thought somewhat about this. And to, to attack that problem, you have to develop a special double truth precepts to pursue politics, to take over the government, and impose the kind of market order that you think will lead to civilization's triumph. All right? So for example, I'm sure, I'm sure this audience doesn't feel that way, but many other people, they think neoliberalism is about deregulation. It's about shrinking government. It's about legal restraints. Low taxes for everyone. Neoliberalism isn't about any of those things at all. Although your average politician will promise them. Yes, it begins to get a, the kind of double truth that you have to live in, with this epistemology. Moreover, and here comes the real harsh part, neoliberals are anti-enlightenment. I think they even recognize this about themselves to a certain extent. Depends who we're talking about here. Um, but the, what is interesting is that the left can't really take this on board. Shall I say it again? The left can't understand that this is an accepted precept of this political movement. And uh, what I have a quote from is George Lakoff, not somebody who I think is particularly deep, but actually at least understood this. And as he said, within traditional liberalism, you have the history of rational thought that's born out of the Enlightenment. All meanings should be literal, everything should follow logically. So if you just tell people the facts, that should be enough. The truth will set you free. All people are fully rational, so if you tell them the truth, you know, with time, they will come to the right conclusions. <coughs> That, of course, has been a disaster. He said that in 2003. Where was everybody? Right? Now, he <coughs> attempts to imitate the, these neoliberals to a certain extent by starting his own think tank. And we can talk about that later. That should people on the left like imitate some of the structures on the right, you know, like, of the, like, like Mount Pelerin or something like that. Well, he thought so. So he starts this Rockridge Institute to confront how to shape oppositional messages in a post-truth environment. And that's the way he sold it, too. Okay? Back in 2003, right? 2005. He, he was forced to close in 2008 due to lack of funding. Hmm. Now we're beginning to talk about asymmetry. All right? Is the left capable of learning? to oppose this epistemology, all right? Or, the way I put it up on the slide, 
why don't think tanks that are nominally on the left act, operate like think tanks on the right? They don't. That's a sign that one, one set of think tanks is held together by a set of philosophical principles. The other is not. The other is held together by politics. All right? Now, um, okay, this is the part you guys aren't really going to like. It's, you didn't like any of the other. <laughs> so I'm going to do this really fast, all right? I think the most common people on the left who are kind of complaining about neoliberalism not existing or blah, 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 are Marxists. Now, you know, did I go and count every single article and count other articles? I mean, I don't have that kind of data. But the, many of the ones that I use in the paper are, are explicitly Marxist complaints about neoliberalism. And I think they've been very vocal about rejecting the mere existence of this as a political project. Okay. Um, Here's a short way of putting it, because for them, they can't see how philosophy and epistemology are central to a political project. It's just like, it's so against their grain, all right? And so they can't see their opponents clearly. And I think this explains a lot of why this kind of endless yammering about neoliberalism and what is it persists. This has something to do with it, okay? Now, um, <laughs> can I do Marxism here and so forth? No, I'm not going to do that. Although, if anyone wants me to do that later, I will. Basically, there are a number of places at which key Marxist concepts are essentially, I mean, more than neutralized. They're emptied of all meaning by developments in the neoliberal worldview and philosophy. I've already mentioned human capital. If you believe in human capital, there's no labor. So you're going to have a little trouble with labor theory of value, right? There is no labor, okay? Uh, uh, the whole term of exploitation in Marxism has to be related to labor in some way. And so if you lose exploitation, you know, where are you? You're halfway to perdition, it seems to be, in any event. Um, I think no one, Marx real, and the classicals really believed in value as though it lived in the commodity, if you've ever actually read any of them. That, that's where it is. It's in there, and you know, and that's why they have all these <laughs> elaborate schemes for passing it on from one to another in production and all this other stuff, which you don't want to know about. Um, if value doesn't live in the commodity anymore, then Marxism is untenable. Can I be any clearer than that? <laughs> that if value doesn't live in the commodity, then Marxism is untenable. Because, and this gets me to the heart of linking back to the talk, Marx's conception of market is a conveyor belt. And that's not so unusual because that's the way classicals thought about markets too. And, and even early neoclassicals. You know, here's some stuff that's in the wrong place we trade and it gets in the right place. Okay. But of course, then in Marx, what that means is that um, uh, trade only shifts surplus between industries. See, I'm getting a little technical here, sorry. Um, uh, profit is not generated in exchange. It's only generated in production. How many times does Marx say that in Capital? <laughs> okay, he really means it. All right, so um, having the idea that, that surplus would be generated through exchange is one of the great uh, Achilles heels of this project. And if we rethink markets to be information processors, Marxism becomes totally irrelevant. So I say that again. Now I know there are some people who don't feel that way. <laughs> They're known as autonomous Marxists. Um, I'm certainly willing to talk about them too if you want. But cognitive capitalism in my view, was a reaction of Marxists to the fact that most of their concepts were being recast by neoliberals. And they thought, ah, oh, we can just sort of appropriate some of these concepts onto our version of Marxism and still have, you know, things like uh, surplus value, still have things like exploitation, so forth and so on. And 
By the way, the things they attempt to graft onto Marxism are neoliberal concepts like the information economy, read Hart and Negri, um, rent seeking. Rent seeking was terminology invented by Buchanan in the Virginia School. So they think they can just reach over and take these concepts from uh, neoliberals and sort of, you know, reconstitute Marxism. Do I spend a lot of time on this? That is a hopeless project. They're, they're, the reason they can't allow neoliberalism to be a real project is because it would show the hopelessness of their intellectual project. All right. I know you wouldn't like that yet, so I'll, let's get light here. <laughs> you know, let's, let, let's lighten up a little. Um, and uh, instead talk about how a couple of contemporary controversies could be, um, let's say, further illuminated by taking seriously the idea that neoliberalism is an epistemic project first and foremost. Okay? And then, of course, playing out what that means. Now, I'm going to start with fake news. Now, um, the first thing that's interesting about fake news is just like with neoliberalism, a bunch of people on the left insist that it doesn't really exist either. Uh, but that's a sign to me. Because it pushes the same buttons. All right. And I've got a couple quotes up here. Uh, you can read them if you want. I think this discussion about fake news is largely a bunch of bullshit. This is the editor of Boston Review. Uh, uh, Columbia Journalism Review. Fake news is about one symptom of shift back to historical norms. Recent hyperventilating mimics reactions from the past. See, it's not real. It's always been with us, blah, 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 blah. And of course, the humiliation is then that Trump in the right wing picks up left terminology, and it did start on the left, and they blast it back at them. Okay, and by the way, this is a, a very Trumpian move, is, but also a very neoliberal move, is to take left concepts and you know, use them as reproaches to the left. Okay, turn them around. And very few people are being serious about this, it seems to me at the moment. Uh, one of them, of all, uh, how many people know about Snopes, the fat teching? Uh, Snopes actually, guy, is way clearer on this because he has to deal with this every day of his life. So um, he says, fake news was a term specifically about people who purposely fabricated stories for clicks and revenue. Now it includes bad reporting, slanted journalism, outright propaganda. We're doing a disservice by lumping all those things together. Amen. <laughs> All right? Fake news doesn't mean anything you want it to mean. It means producing fabricated stories for clicks and revenue. Okay? Now, uh, what's kind of interesting is that, I don't, I don't know, any of you guys ever watched some of these Adam Curtis things? Um, Adam Curtis has been expressing himself on this issue for a fairly long time now. And he himself has some, I think, fairly interesting takes on this, although, again, I'm not going to endorse them entirely. Um, lately, he has gotten the bug of blaming everything on the Russians. I'm not sure why that is, because I'm going to argue that earlier Adam Curtis wasn't like this. Um, he says explicitly that this comes from this fellow, uh, Vlad uh, Vladislav Surkov. Anyone heard of Surkov? Yeah. Um, I don't want to read this whole thing, but he's an he's a advisor to Putin. He originally came from the avant-garde world, and those who have studied his career say that what Surkov has done is import ideas from conceptual art into the very heart of politics. His aim was to undermine people's perception of the world so that they never know what's really happening. Surkov turned Russian politics into a bewildering, constantly changing piece of theater, blah, 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 blah. The key thing was that Surkov then let it be known that this was, he was, that is what he was doing, which meant that no one was sure what was real or fake. See, so Adam has long been interested in this whole problem of how this starts off, but there was an earlier Adam Curtis, um, which of course I'm more partial to, um, uh, who 
said that one of the reasons this kind of uh, funhouse mirror effect is so important is because neoliberal think tanks have perverted and strangled ideological thinking. By the way, this is a uh, lift from one of his uh, uh, voiceovers. Um, Curtis and others point towards something that is far more insidious than Orwell's Ministry of Truth. Once the neoliberal image of the market as both means of conveyance and validation of ideas took hold, remember, that's the key point, then it shaped and informed changes in the very means and conduct of argumentation <coughs> in general. Befuddlement became an active political strategy very different from the top-down broadcast model of 20th century propaganda. This is why people on the left who just say, oh, it's just propaganda, they're wrong. This is not about propaganda. It's about something else. Rather, these days, disinformation is predicated upon the creation of a fog of confusion and disillusion, and less directly promoted by the straightforward media manipulation, uh, the bugaboo of the nostalgic left, than the harvesting through social media of the inchoate folder roll of the general populace. All right? Now, what I want to demonstrate to you I'm not going fast enough. Um, what I want to just demonstrate to you is that there was some discussion about this in the neoliberal thought collective. All right. And it has something to do with what has happened. Where's the previous? Oh, well, I'm missing one. I'll tell you what it is. Um, uh, the people that I'm going to be talking about are Leo Strauss. Um, whose uh, important work is Persecution and the Art of Writing. 1952. Ronald Coase, who you already heard about, but actually my favorite work of Ronald Coase is about his disgust about the BBC, which I will tell you about. And then George Stigler, whose uh, collected uh, papers was, was published as Intellectual in the Marketplace in 1963. So notice, this is a, actually a fairly short window in which these things are being discussed. <laughs> Let's do Strauss. <laughs> I have to do Strauss in a minute. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Strauss, I want to insist, was not a member of Mont Halloran, unlike the other two, but had, uh, in, uh, I try to demonstrate this, had substantial interactions with Hayek and the other neoclassicals while at Chicago, so it's not like they didn't know what he was about. Uh, in this book, he argued that when reading pre modern thinkers, and see, this is the important thing, that it starts off being a kind of a little bit away from the, he's not about the present, at least in much of Strauss. When reading pre-modern thinkers, it's necessary to read between the lines. He argued that the writers were concerned with the conflict between the quest for truth and the strictures of society. They may seem to argue for one thing sanctioned by law and culture, but in fact expect a second more attuned set of readers to take away a different message, sometimes the opposite of what appears to be the initial thesis. Um, here's some stuff he actually, uh, you know, uses examples from Maimonides, and, and he uses the fact that they had to hide their Jewishness and all that. Okay, I don't need to go into that. But later on, he says this is true of all philosophy of law in this book. All law has to operate this way, um, and uh, the the uh, exterior literal meaning of the law serves to sustain a political community, which requires fealty to particular forms of behavior and belief, whereas a different esoteric meaning of the law is a matter of philosophical speculation only for those capable of handling it responsibly. Shall I say that again? <laughs> only for those capable of handling it responsibly. Multiple contradictory messages serve to strengthen the polity. That's the beginning. Now we get to Coase. Coase has this lovely rant against the, the British broadcasting system, which he hated and wanted to be destroyed back in 1950. This is before he's famous for this other stuff. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. Um, as, as he says, uh, should I read this? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a quote from the book. As it would express by a reviewer of Mr. Reese's book in the Times Literary Supplement, to employ broadcasting for the dissemination of the shoddy, the vulgar, and the sensational would be a blasphemy against human nature. That's the quote from Reith. This is Coase. This argument that certain demands are unworthy of being met 
implies a philosophy which we now call totalitarian. This is 1950, see, so that's, that's nasty, right? That's like saying you're a commie, okay? I want you to get that across, that basically he was convinced that the masses should be provided as much of the shoddy, the vulgar, and the sensational as they could stomach. I'm not making a joke here. That, no, he didn't come right out and say, you know, give them shoddy, give them vulgar. But it's clear that he means they should be given as much as they could stomach. The notion that some entity like the state might curate the quality of what was available through a public channel in the interest of setting standards for public discourse was regarded as an anathema. The market would know more capably how to sort out what people should and could know by itself. This is 1950. All right, so what are we saying here? That this whole idea that you would try to shape the narrative, shape the message for the polity is totalitarianism. See, this is why the expert thing is not going to work in their eyes. Right. No, it's not. I'm just pointing out, okay? Um, now, the third person that is important here is George Stigler. I know he doesn't get as much airplay as Milton Friedman song, but actually, I, I think of him as a way deeper thinker than Friedman. Friedman is just the front man. He says stupid things on, on the TV and stuff like that. I mean, no, it's Stigler who's really trying to think this through. And he believed that there's nothing to be done about the debased and vulgar predispositions of the populace. Nothing. You see, back to this epistemology. One must take them as given. And he has this complaint that no amount of training would eliminate the instinctive dislike of a system of organizing economic life through the search for profits. You see? So there's nothing, you know, you can't get rid of it. Markets will simply pander to the lowest common denominator, and this can only be encouraged. You see? What are you going to do? The way forward was instead to convene a small elite of like-minded thinkers, not to give people more direct that they wanted, but to anticipate what their rich patrons would need to think in the future and produce these doctrines avant la lettre in order to bring about a society that would eventually voluntarily support the market. See? This is the justification for Montpellier. And the, the, it's been brought up, the Matryoshka doll structure. It's explicitly saying this is what we have to do. So, uh, Folgerol and vulgar sensationalism promoted for the masses and then for a small elite. What do they get? A Leo Strauss kind of economics. All right? So it's interesting, this just demonstrates that they really did think about these things. They thought, oh, what do you do if most people are dumb? You really believe that? You really believe the market is the only truth? What, what should you do? Um, but of course, none of them foresaw anything like the internet. And, and by the way, this is the grand fortuitous event that doesn't, you know, they didn't bring it about, they had nothing to do with it, but it is one of their greatest gifts. Once they have, notice that they've developed this position well before the internet appears. All right. Basically, I'm just <laughs> summarizing here. It's much more complicated than this. Basically, what the internet allows is to recast the market as an amplifier, not simply to give people the gibberish, the vulgarity, the twaddle, but to take it from the people and give it back to them in a cybernetic loop. <laughs> so that they have no clue what is actually going on. And remember, there's no guilt felt about this because these people can't handle it. So this is, you know, this is what they deserve. You know, we're not sort of pulling a fast one on them or something. We're just giving them what they want. And moreover, the beauty of this is the objectives are the transformation of this feedback loop and endless befuddlement into a lucrative source of profit. See, that if you can make profit off this process on top of it, this is the ideal neoliberal device. Okay. And then rendering the populace more docile in the face of neoliberal takeover of the government. Okay. 
You see that I'm kind of talking about something that's going on now. <laughs> All right. Um, um, you guys already know this, I probably don't need to do this a lot. I mean, this is part of the, the God-given effects of the internet that then work together with the epistemological position. Uh, newspaper circulations have been declining for a long time, since 2003. Now I know, you know, lately, Wall Street, uh, uh, New York Times and stuff said, oh, you know, ever since Trump, our circulation got stuff. Don't get too excited. This has been going on for more than a decade now. It's not being really reversed. Not in any serious way. And then, of course, advertising revenue for those kinds of sources of news has really been going down the toilet as well. And you all know this, nothing surprising here. Um, <clears throat> what's happening is that people are shifting where they get their news from. Um, this is, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the source. I'll it in a minute. Um, the, this is a, a, a survey which attempts to find out where they get their news from. Now, of course, it's got all the problems of reporting bias and everything, but still, what happens is that people are. Fewer and fewer people are getting their news, certainly from newspapers. Um, fewer and fewer from radio. And what's growing are digital sources. News websites, apps, social networking sites. And we do have some idea of which sites are more important than others. This was done by the BBC and Reuters instead. And, when you, and by the way, it's across 26 countries too, so it's sort of interesting that it you know, goes across many cultural areas. That um, Facebook, and YouTube, and then number four is Twitter, are the most common sources of news for the people who report back on this uh, survey. Okay? So, what do we got? We now have the means at hand to actualize this political project in a way that we did not really have before. Some of you uh, maybe saw this kind of semi-funny thing, Channel 4 News, they went to this place in Macedonia, found these teenagers. Um, turned out they, they had started up a large number of these news websites themselves, and they had, were showing uh, uh, monthly incomes of 7,500 euro in a, in a town where the average monthly salary was 350 euro. Okay? So, what we get is we start getting these things pop up. And what I want to be, be clear about is while it is true that some of them are generated from within the deal of a thought collective, most of them are generated from without. That's important to know, all right? That a lot of this fake news is in fact coming from any crazy person who wants to set up a website and make some money. So that gets us. Oh, um, of course, Channel 4 wanted to spin it like it all happens in uh, Eastern Europe or something. <laughs> you know, I could talk about that. I mean, there's a kind of a, you know, sort of distinct, distancing it to the other, like it's their fault. But as it turns out, overall, there are four stages of uh, the enabling of fake news, which makes this an unbeatable proposition. Okay. First, is, and I haven't talked about this, the de-skilling and casualization of journalist labor. You guys know this, that journalists cannot be kept on a beat. <laughs> oh, I that the journalists would be on a beat. What a crazy idea. Um, uh, they, you know, they have to move from one topic to the next. They have to watch their clicks all the time. And all of this is turning into more and more casualized labor. Okay, so there's that. And then <clears throat> what you do is you place people with algorithms to call, curate, and convey news through platforms. So you've got the generation issue, which is more about de-skilling, and then you have the platform issue, which is more about how it's going to get transmitted through these social media. And then, <coughs> this is how automation brings us to the very doorstep of Bedlam. Now, because there are all these sites, and God knows who they are, and what they <laughs> are actually doing, we need to automate the selling and placement of advertising which funds the platforms. Okay? People have not paid attention to this. 
that now, because there's no personal relationship between the people, you know, paying these for this advertising and, and these all these weirdo sites. So basically, it is all automated on top of it. And then finally, and this really is hell. I'll make sure we got hell in there. Once you start automating the, the curation, you automate the selling and the buying. You might as well automate some of the receivers of this fake news too. <laughs> Why not? And that's the rise of political bots. Political bots, among other reasons, exist to take this noise and propagate it further. Okay. <clears throat> now you might say, um, wait a minute, what do neoliberals have to do with this? Because they didn't, you know, they didn't start the internet, they didn't start necessarily the social media, and stuff like that. Well, here's an example of how this happens, and I'm sure some of you heard of this. It happened a while ago. Um, Facebook added a function to curate news through its trending box, thus becoming one of the major sources of this kind of pass along of this news. Then in May 2016, when poorly sourced anonymous insider to uh, Facebook claimed that the human editors who were doing the curating of the trending box were biased and routinely suppressed conservative websites. You see, this is where the male liberals actually intervene. They no, 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 humans are, you know, they're not letting Breitbart through. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> not really, that was a complaint. Okay. So in other words, someone at a neoliberal think tank was myth that Facebook would actually take into account the credibility of the source, like Breitbart, before listening it to a general news feed. See, they're offended. You can't do that. So Gizmodo, the neoliberal echo chamber, blows this up into Cos Celebra, crying censorship. Mark Zuckerberg was forced to grovel with sort of some right-wing personalities. And then, of course, three months later, Human editors for this trending box are fired, and it was replaced by algorithms. And by the way, even uh, Washington Post covered this. Immediately, the volume of fake news on Facebook exploded. Okay. So you see, they do have a little bit of a role in this. They want to make sure it goes our way. They didn't invent it. I want to be clear about what I'm saying here. They didn't invent it. They didn't invent those poor guys in Macedonia. But they want to make sure that this goes their way. Okay? And that's part of how this becomes a political project. Okay? Um, uh, I don't know how much you want to do about this. Um, advertisers can't keep track of where all their ads appear, so they automate it, as I've already mentioned. Um, and of course, why is that okay? Why is it okay to automate the selling of ads? Because the market is better than any human being sorting out the truth. So the people who should be getting these ads are getting them. You see? You know, you could come back to them, like I've got this quote from this guy who compares all these low quality sites to, um, uh, you know, <laughs> underwater mortgages and everything like that. But see, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because it's the market that's going to tell us ultimately what needs to be supported and what not. It's very important. Okay. And then, as I've already suggested, the ultimate apotheosis of algorithmic intervention is to automate the audience. <laughs> you've automated the news, you've automated the sale, automate the audience. Um, I won't read all this, but uh, uh, political bots, as algorithms are designed to operate on social media, they exist because of this ecology, because it works. Right? And uh, it's estimated by these two guys at, at Oxford that bots comprise somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% of all online tra traffic. So don't get too you know, happy about your own little feed. And, <laughs> You're probably just talking to machines anyway. <laughs> in fact, what's better induced, what's better, a better way to induce despair in the populace concerning democracy than to realize that deliberative democracy is a sham? 
You're just talking to robots. See, that's why I worry about people who are in favor of deliberative democracy. These guys have a, they've got a massive machine to destroy deliberative democracy here. And they're happy with that. That's good. Because people are stupid. And you can't trust them. See, this is a problem because if the left starts talking like that too, where are we? <laughs> Can you stand a little more? Mm -hmm. No, I'm going to shift gears here. See, because um, I'm glad that, glad that Frank talked about all these um, devices for uh, attempting to score and uh, to a certain extent allocate and control various processes. Because you have to realize that if you really believe this, you don't want to stop there. And this is why I worry about your idea that narrative can help. Okay. See, if you really believe this epistemology that I told you about, what's your main target? Yes. Come on, think about it. What's your main target? Science! Science is the real problem. People who think they know things. People who think they're experts. And so, really, what they want is they want to totally reorganize science as well. Yes, now you've got to go down to the heart. <laughs> got to get there in the heart of darkness to see how this works. You want to reorganize science. Okay? And that's what open science is about. Uh, I guess I don't have any scientists in the audience because this is where I get moans and people say, no, morality, you're full of shit, and stuff like that. Because they think they're doing this noble work of opening up science. Open, they totally misunderstand what open science is about. Open science is a political project to reform and democratize science in a direction which totally neutralizes the role of expertise. Because experts are the problem. See, you guys complain about the university, and I agree. But you see, even that is not all the way down. See, if they can, if they can neoliberal, neoliberally reorganize science, then they've won. Where's the resistance going to come from? Okay. It's not about getting a few downloads of journal articles for free, which is the way so many people talk about it. And that's such a red herring. Okay. Um, what they want to do is they want to reorganize and re-engineer the research process from the bottom up. And by the way, just as in so many other cases of neoliberal projects, this is being carried out by shadowy think tanks. I've got names in the paper. So if you want to know who they are, um, by so-called foundations of dubious, who, who's, whose sole purpose in life seems to be to push this. Okay. But of course, automation of science will lead to bedlam in the same way of automation to news. See, they really are the same case in a weird sort of way. Okay. Now, what could openness mean in science? There's a very simplified... Uh, you know, think about a research project of your own. <coughs> and you start off, eh, I don't know what I'm going to work on, whatever, you know. Um, and then I you read around a little bit, start a bibliography maybe, something like that. Then, you know, if I narrow down, I start collecting some data, yes, you know, maybe to, that I'm going to analyze. Then I got some working notes, I'm trying to put some order into this. And then, you know, maybe if I finally think I understand it, I draft a paper. Um, then, of course, that goes out to journals or wherever publishers, and they have a say changing it. And then there are comments, possibly after publication, from, from others. Okay? Everyone see that this is kind of the, the path. Now, these folks argue that most of this process is, as I say, not public. Right? It's you, and your own little books, and your own little data, and so That's no good. What we want is we want this research project to be public at every stage along the way. I want you to think about that. 
That's what they want. They just don't want to give away a few journal articles. They want this to be public all the way through. Or, as I put it down here, get rid of the old-fashioned scientific journal. Put all activities online in real time. Distribute it across many participants. See, there's no, and this was mentioned too, about personality and the person. No, 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 you want to get rid of that. That's the neoliberal way to go. That this whole project should be distributed across many different people, kind of divided up into parts. All right? Uh, and fragment the research process into modular, semi-automated programs, which will be responsible for coordinating it all along the way. We don't need the intelligence of the individual researcher. All we need is this automation. Understand? Okay. And who's going to coordinate this and make it be verified as truth? Not anyone along the way. It's only the one <coughs> that's going to tell us. What is the truth? You see, when you believe this, you believe it all the way down. <sighs> so. What are we going to see in the near future? By the way, we're already seeing it. i got a slide to show you that it's already happening. I don't have to imagine this shit. All right. That primarily it's about breaking up the research process into component parts, de-skilling some, automating the others. Heavy tailor is component to this. Okay. Uh, Chris Newfield, who's in California, is actually quite good on this. He says that part of the new business model of controlling the research through the platform, not through the IP. I can't tell you how many people think that they're doing deep work into the commercialization of science by looking at patents. Patents are way too late in the game. Screw patents. What they want is they want this real-time surveillance and control all the way through the process. And the way you do that is you build a platform. Right. Um, we could talk about open access if you want to. As I said, that's more or less a red herring. And of course, neoliberal science wants flexible, responsive workers who can switch research programs in response to market signals, right? That's what it's, you know, you shouldn't stick with something just because you're interested in it. <laughs> if the market says no, then it's no. Even though you're only like a third of the way through it. So, what we are talking about, and by the way, they say this, this is not me. We are talking about Facebook-like platforms to actually run science. So what we'll have is we'll have destruction of legacy journals. And remember, you know, this is often sold to people as, oh, those journals, they're so, you know, they, those big Elsevier, they just make money off of us and so forth. Now, you gotta be careful, that's just part of the the sideline, you know, that's just one part of the, the, the trick. Um, cheap, de-skilled labor, central panopticon for outsiders to monitor nascent research programs. You see how this is so important? Is that really the people behind this want to know where is the research front right now? In real time. And this promises it. And then, of course, there's another thing for everyone who whines about peer review. These guys want to get rid of peer review, too. Why? Because the market only knows what's true. I will stop here. Just so you think I'm not making this up. God forbid. What I've done is, that, notice I've done the same thing as the previous chart. I've got different phases of the research program. And then down this side, this might be a, you need a little explanation. I've got different people placed at different locations relative to that particular research program. So, for example, you know, there's the normal scientist who's pursuing the program. There are the funders. There are competing scientists. By the way, I see they're part of it too. You, gotta, you know, what's competition? Um, there are spectator scientists who really, you know, they're not going to do anything, but you know, they're. <laughs> can't stop them from expressing their opinion anyway, sort of thing. Um, and then outsider citizens. 
because citizens should be folded into open science, right? Nobody knows more than anybody else, and nobody's cheaper than citizens. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So, what we've got is these are actual names of programs that attempt to provide a, a, uh, the beginnings of a platform in order to pr perform those functions for that kind of person. Now, as you see, we've got a lot of different people, a lot of different functions. So the map right now is kind of scattered, right? It's got, it's got all these different kinds of things. By the way, almost all startups, no mistake, all right, um, wanting to do that. Now, here's why I bring this up to you. By the way, it includes stuff like academia.edu and all this. I'm sure all of you are involved with some of this already. <laughs> okay. Or what, what's the other one? Not the sort of the research EDU, whatever. Da, 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 da. Whatever. Um, the point is, this is like early days, back when Facebook was just little Facebook. And, uh, you know, what was the other one, the awful one, MySpace? Yeah. And, and da, da, da. this is where we are now in science. Okay? Now, what we've got is we've got a bunch of the individual components being formalized. By the way, including peer review. Do you know that um, uh, Elsevier has patented peer review? <laughs> I can't make this up. All right? So we've got a bunch of different parts. None of these parts are going to be by themselves grand winners. But once the thing shakes out a little, Somebody with deep pockets. I would say uh, Google mm -hmm. or Facebook will come along and buy up the main, uh, the main working programs, consolidate it into one platform, and there will be one platform controlling most science. God, doesn't that sound great? <laughs> <laughs> this is what's coming. And this is what it means to really believe in that epistemic principle. That you would be willing to push it this far because this is how the market is really going to validate knowledge. And then once this falls, the university is an easy pushover. Okay, so. a kind of a gateway drug, right? I mean, <laughs> you're 14, you read it, you get all excited, and then, you know, and then uh, the Liberty Fund knows how to identify you. That's the way I think of it. So, what, what I'm really interested in, I, I've had some friends who are supply-side economists, yeah. and um, they're, my question is, can the neoliberal exist without Christianity? Not from a very, very... No, that's a very, very interesting but, question. But, but the, but... Um, the Christian right. Right, right, right. Because here, there's a different epistemology, right? There's right. humility, there's yes. something built into I it. Agree. I mean, they, they can just like, we're not going to read Buskin. We'll just concentrate on these parables of the New Testament. Uh -huh. So, you know, how would a neoliberal or a libertarian read or... It's a great question. It is one of their... How, how can I put this? It is one of their trials. It's one of the things that they, they want and they can never quite fix. Let me just give you one example. Um, at the very first meeting, Frank Knight went. Uh, maybe most people probably don't know. Frank Knight kind of was this crotchety guy who just hated Catholics and you know, hated 
Christians kind of. And, stuff. and so he actually does a paper saying how Christianity is opposed to Neil, what we believe. That was like the, the worst blow up of the first meeting. Yeah, people don't know that. Right? That is just like, can we really like do that? You know, admit what you're saying that, that it's it, they're antithetical and so forth. And by the way, Hayek did not want to. Hayek kept thinking, yeah, there's a, some kind of Christianity out there. That's, and by the way, th this also creates a further problem for them because remember, even early on, they're very cosmopolitan. They want to send people out to you know very far away places, and so. Uh, like on the third meeting, somebody comes back from uh, China and says, uh, well, you know, maybe Buddhism is coherent. You see? And, and like they argue about that, and they're like, oh, no, I don't know, maybe that's not. See, they don't, and, and it's not like there aren't people and think tanks dedicated to this. See, I mean, I want you to know that, too. There's this guy who just died. Anyone heard of him, Michael Novak? Yeah, right. I mean, you know, there's a whole bunch of them that they keep saying, oh, well, just, you know, maybe being Christian is like being an entrepreneur. You know, I just think it's just rubbish. But, but they're, willing, they're willing to try anything to reconcile, all right? They know they're not successful, but they're not giving up. And see, that's important for this kind of fusionist story that's often told in history, in American history, about the right. That is, you know, they had to make moves for the Christian conservatives to somehow get on board with this otherwise uh, horrendous doctrine that they, you know, the Christians possibly might hate. And so they really had to do a lot of smoozing to kind of make it be okay in some way. It's, there's no answer to this. I mean, they want it, and there's no logical answer to this at all. Well, uh, yeah, back to that. Um, thanks. Um, I guess I feel a little bit confused by the argument about Marxism, and I want to try to understand uh, it. Yeah, yeah. I, blew, uh, I just blew by that one. <laughs> well, I mean, okay. Well, well, for one thing, I'm not sure. I mean, even if you think of it as a sort of an intellectual argument, Obviously, it's an intellectual argument, and it was an intellectual argument with the marginalists as well, right? Um, right. Sort of an opposition between the two modes of understanding right. the economy and understanding history and understanding individuals, right. etc., right? Um, yeah. And I understand that, and I'm not even entirely sure that I agree that a concept like human capital is so radically opposed to, say, Marxist theory of free production costs or something. No, that's, um, that's not me. I, there's a bunch of people who are. Right. I, yeah. So imagine. that's maybe that, and then that's sort of getting at my other my question, really. Um, I mean, also, you know, chapter one, volume one, Marx says value is not a substance, it's a social relation. But, um, right. but right. I guess my question is just I get a little confused about the difference between, say, from the neoliberals' perspective, this invalidates the Marxist critique, right? And saying, which it seemed to me you were saying, this invalidates the Marxist critique, period, right? Because surely we don't all agree that only entrepreneurs live fully realized lives and the rest of us. No, 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 I understand. Problems, right? So given that okay. we don't agree with the other No, you're Marxism, right. I wasn't clear. I, I wasn't clear. No, Here, here's what I would like to say about that. Although I would go on and on about value theory if you want me to, but I don't want to make that the point of contention. One of the main reasons the neoliberals are successful is because they have altered the image of what a market is for the average person. Um, that uh, markets are no longer conveyance devices. I don't. Most people don't think of them that way. Most people have no trouble with the mantra marketplace of ideas, and most people see the market as kind of stating the truth in some way. Now, of course, not to the extent that these people are saying, but so the and this is the role of the computer. As markets become more and more compar compared to computers, there's a whole other side of me that you haven't seen. Um, then, in effect, those two things melt. That talking about markets as computers makes them seem more like information processors, makes them closer to the image of the market that neoliberals believe in. See, that's what autonomous Marxism is doing. Autonomous Marxism recognizes that and thinks it can somehow play off of that. Right? When in fact, by the time you have transformed what a market is to that extent, 
I, you don't have any of the other Marxist categories to work with. I would argue. That's the, you're asking, what am I saying? That's what I'm saying. But the, I mean, okay. the cognitive capitalist people are making a historical argument, right? They're actually saying things change about capitalism such that the older Marxist conception of the particular Marxist conception of exploitation that we get out of the labor theory of value yeah. is exactly obtained, right? Though they're staying much more firmly within it than, than I think you're Oh, no, of course right? they are. But, but, but the argument that, that you're making is that seems to me to be that the very, at the conceptual level, that the very concept of human capital somehow invalidates not simply the way that Marxists think that we should talk mm. about the market, but the way that Marxists no, no, actually be careful. Work. What I really said was that insofar as your average person thinks about the market as an information processor now, the neoliberals have won. Relative to any Marxist story. But you That's what say, I'm saying. But you wouldn't say that because we think differently about science, that science is wrong. I didn't say wrong. I said this is what you, you have to address this image of the market in order to begin to talk about some kind of political economy. But I guess I just don't understand why you would say that, that that simply because that theory of political economy, that aspects of that theory of political economy are not accepted by the ideological wing of contemporary economics, that somehow that invalidates the theory itself, which was what you were saying. Yeah, no, but maybe we should talk about this later, because I, I, I disagree as to my interpretation of what I'm saying, basically. Yeah. I do found this. Uh remarkably both compelling and uh, utterly depressing. Point yeah, I had that effect on people. Um, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure that was, your, was one of your attention. But I, I'm wondering about the double truth status once yeah. computers go. Right. That is, um, if, if one of the epistemological or philosophical principles of neoliberalism is that there are those who know uh, and there are those who can never know, um, what is it um, once bots uh, become uh, the most efficient uh, and let's call it knowledgeable uh, conveyors of uh, and agencies for this knowledge emerge? What is it that sustains the distinction uh, between a bot, which would be, according to this logic, the ideal neoliberal knower? because the figure who is working the double feedback loop most effectively. What is it that would sustain the, the difference between those who belong to the neo-liberal okay. thought collective as the real cognoscente? Okay, uh, um, there's a bunch of things going on there. So first let me, this thing between those who know and those who don't know. They actually have a kind of a faux humility that I also want to make sure I point out. That you're saying, oh, well, there are these people in the know, and they say, nah, not really, it's the market, you know. Now, what's interesting, this is why we get to the double truth. I mean, the double truth is, well, why, why don't you just passively accept what the market produces? Well, no, because we have to produce the right kind of market. See, that's the trick, okay. And then, you know, so that allows them to kind of intervene in a political way. Not that they have this special knowledge, although, the reason I told you about the Strauss stuff and things like that is that someone has to be able to see <laughs> that this process works like this. See, I mean, you're really treading a fine line here. And so there's a kind of a double truth about that. It's stuck in a dilemma. I mean, how then, if the market knows and is the, is, is the means whereby knowledge gets simultaneously produced, validated, and circulated, yeah. What is it that sustains the distinction um, that makes a difference between the market and the figure who would claim the capacity uh, to know how to produce the market that would know? That person would have to be a bot. Mm -hmm. um, well, they're not against that, so that's certainly true. But I think you're also, um, you are asking me, how do we see those special uh, insider esoteric I'm figures? You about the basic premises okay. of your story, in which you have produced, um, and, and it's a, I, I, it's it's a sublated conspiracy story, in which there are agents who know, and it, who, who know that the market knows alone, mm -hmm. and those who have to be 
uh, figures who are to understand themselves in their subordination to the market as truly because they are thereby. No, that's true. Uh, and and, and in, in order to sustain that distinction, there would have to be some criteria that would enable the those who know to distinguish themselves from those who don't know. Well, see, because, I, because right, according right. to this logic, if I can just point out your, the contradiction in it, because those who claim to know would have to then um, also recognize, according to the logics of the enterprise, that what they know is also the product of the market, uh, that they are retroactively um, representing. So, so you, you, you want this epistemology to be about the agent. I want it to be and, and that, No, you want it to be about the agent. That's not the same thing. And in fact, how do people in the thought collective recognize those who know, which is sort of what you're asking me. Well, they recognize those who know by having these institutional structures that are intercalated with each other, which make sure that everyone is on the same page, and that's how they recognize those who know. I know it's not very satisfying from an epistemological uh, uh, viewpoint, but they don't give a shit about agency. So you've got to get off that. That agency what is. What do you mean by philosophical then? You say this is a philosophical principle. I don't know what the hell you mean by that. That you could think that um, agency is not where truth lives? Is that not a philosophical principle? I don't know. I don't know what you're uh, upset about. Uh, other than maybe that you don't like the way that looks, but. This is a position. Okay. Yeah. That's just a, I don't want to put the question of like, what should we do? But <laughs> I, <laughs> but I, I guess, but I want to frame it in a, I guess in a softer way, which would be, I know that like David F. Noble's work, he's talked about the history of governments for science. And I think in his story, he said that he tries to portray a story where elite universities, elite scientists manage to tell Congress, give us autonomy, and to avoid democratic control over the research agenda. I think that's what happened, yeah, in a certain time period, which is now over, yes. Right, and that was what immediately came to mind when you mentioned the Cold War expert yes. model, as well as like Joel Isaac's right. like his, uh, yes. history of science thing. So I'm just wondering, I mean, do you think that was ultimately a positive step for science for them to be able to do this? Or do you think that there's an even better approach, which is implied, I guess, in yeah, right. there should be more democratic control of science? Right, yeah. See, I think um, while that was the complaint against that Cold War situation, that it wasn't democratic, you have to remember that it was um, situated in a period where, from the 20s onwards, there was a great skepticism about the rationality and cognitive abilities of the populace. And see, that didn't go away. <laughs> that was just kind of like suppressed to a certain extent. And the expert was the solution to that, okay? See, a way of rethinking this would have to, I think, attack at two levels. One, what is a market? See, the left would have to have a story about a market that's not an information processor, if you're asking me. That would, you would have to build up from. And secondly, you, you would have to have a different story about uh, the <laughs> cognitive makeup of a social person. All right? And then your politics would have to build up from those. I'm just saying this would be a, uh, you know, this would be a parallel to what they did. Okay? Your politics had to build up from those. And not just say, oh, democracy. See, because democracy by itself doesn't solve anything. You have to have positions about people's cognitive abilities, how the ideas get transferred, and you also have a story about what markets can and can't do. And I would be happy with a story that says that markets, in fact, there is no such thing as a generic market. And that's, that, see, that's what's wrong with all of this. What's wrong with all this is that everyone buys that, and it's just false. It's, you know, what there are, there are many different kind of weird little algorithmic markets all over the place. And some of them have high power, and some of them have low power, so that means we've got to start talking about this, like in ecology, and see, you see what I mean? So you, got, you, would have, you really would have to build this up from ground up, and I don't think democracy does that for the left. I mean, just appealing to the left. 
democracy. It doesn't do that for that. That there has to be this kind of dual story of how knowledge works that would be plausible as a rival to this. I, I don't know about you, but I think your average person believes a lot of this stuff. You know? Now. So that's the problem. Um, so to get back to the sort of first question about the kind of coalition, you know, however fraught, you know, that a really much confusion between the religious right and sort of the neoliberal thought collective and, and, and those who sort of adhere to that, is, is one possible kind of historical answer to that question about how that coalition is managed about the idea of persecution or victimhood? So like, I, I feel like yeah. one major thesis yeah. that I get out of this talk is sort of that the, the, the trick of the neoliberal thought collective and their great success is that to distinguish between the market and to distinguish between society is impossible. Uh, and in well, fact, yeah, there's no there's no independent thing right. that they're going to theorize called society. Right. Yes. Right. And, and as a result, the sort of the maybe you could call it a kind of attitudinal position, right, or uh, a kind of emotional position with respect to society that is shared between the neoliberal thought collective and the kind of conservative religious right is this idea of being persecuted, i.e. our economic yeah, thought. Yeah, I mean, I mean that's a second level thing, but yeah, you know, they all share that, that, you know, you always, you, you don't let us on campus, you don't let us have, you know, it's just it's ridiculous. And the godlessness of state socialism too, right? Yeah. Be the other common antagonist. Although, see, since the, the fall of, you know, the Soviet Union, you don't hear that quite so much anymore, although, you know, who knows, it could, could come again. Um, and in fact, that's what, you know, this modern fear of Islam throws a wrench into all of this, right? Because then how do they respond to that in any way? Okay. I, I think they struggle with that, too, actually. Uh, it's the flip side of them wanting to make a uh, pact with, uh, you know, Christians or whomever. Yeah, I think I just I was just sort of wondering. I mean, it's not unrelated to that historically. Just basically, is this idea of right whether or not the market, i.e., human freedom, is being managed by an external authority, or right religious people are right being regulated or discriminated against or impinged upon by some externality to their freedom as people. Like, I, I don't know if you think that's just kind of an accidental articulation or if there's some sort of shared substance there that's kind of... I think what most religious people talk about as freedom doesn't map into what neoliberals talk about as freedom. That's the part of the problem. Like they, they really don't refer to the same thing either. Okay. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if the That's a very good insight. Yes, and it wants to do that. Hayekian version is right. Get rid of right. on that. Right. Um, so that it's 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 an unusual version of elitism if we want to truncate it back to that term. Mm -hmm. Right. Because because Hayek is trying to do see, but that's a, the, you know, I, I agree with you entirely. But it's it's a contradiction that they have lived since the origin of the Mont Pelerin Society. What is the Mont Pelerin Society? Well, it was Hayek's hand-picked elite. <laughs> No, really. I mean, no. There was no other way you could join it originally. I mean, Hayek thought you were part of this elite, and so forth. And yet, it's Hayek who wants to claim that you know elites are useless and need to be undone by them. You see, I mean, I just think they've, I, I've said this any number of times that they just have to live this, and it's pointed out to them too. So it's not me whining about it. Um, Karl Popper, kind of says, well, wait a minute. You know, if this really is a discussion society. Um, shouldn't we have some kind of lefties or socialists in too and stuff like that? And Hayek says, oh, come on, Carl, shut up. And, and really, honest to God, and that's it. See? So there are other voices saying, open it up, you know, have a real discussion. So he said, no, 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 no. It's got to be among a closed group where there's a large amount of agreement. He actually says that to Popper. There has to be a closed group with a large amount of agreement to do anything. 
and yet he is Mr. Anti-Expert. See, that is. That's. Uh, yeah. You had gestured at the beginning of your talk that, that you were going to make a final point rebutting the argument that uh, Trump means the end of neoliberalism, an argument. Oh, well, no, that. I just think that's a very you gestured to it yeah, several, yeah, okay. several no, that's times right. I, I just think that's... But I wonder if you could address it more directly. I, I, see, if we, want, if we want to turn politics personalized, then we can all try to figure out this crazy person and stuff like that, and that's just a waste of time. I mean, but he's, he's very useful in this kind of noise production, which is absolutely very central to the story that I've been telling. But, so you see him as a fulfillment? In oh, well, well, he's a fulfillment of that aspect, but then, you know, there's Heritage Action ready with a list of people who, you know, he doesn't, does he care who's undersecretary of, you know, this, that, and the other? No, he doesn't give a shit at all. And so they just come with their guys and they, you know, they come with their plans. By the way, a lot of the cuts, he didn't come up with that either. That was all Heritage Action. I mean, this has all been documented. It's like, yeah, you don't have to listen to me. So, so the, the the neoliberal thought collective is, is totally active, you know, taking advantage of this. It's just that, particularly with regard to this epistemic issue, he's really useful. This creating of this fog. Mm -hmm. right. But he's not so good on the mark. Well, look, it, in a sense, it doesn't really matter because he doesn't care. You know what I mean? I'm not particularly sure how to ask this question, so if you choose to not answer it, totally fine. Sure, but sure. Um, I was wondering if you could address the issue of climate change, not <laughs> in the yeah, sense of right. open science, but I'm wondering as a right, right, physical right. level how right. climate change might actually change the world that neoliberals see and operate in. Look, um, I hate to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, that uh, I have this book called Never Let a Serious Crisis Go to Waste. And in the last chapter, I spent 20 pages talking about what is the neoliberal vision of what to do about climate change. So I would ask you to look there for the elaborate version. But the short version is they don't have one policy, just like they don't have one policy for anything. Wake up. That's not how you do this kind of fogs thing, right? No, you've got to have a lot of policies that kind of interlock with each other to produce the ultimate political outcome. What's the short term? You guys all know this. Denialism. Question. Do they ever think they're going to change the science that way? No, they're not stupid. Denialism merely exists to buy time for the other things, okay? What's the intermediate phase? Intermediate phase is, you know, what's the always the neoliberal answer to any problem? More markets, right? So we'll have, you know, markets for this and markets for, you know, carbon capture and, you know, markets for credits and all this kind of stuff. And of course, that never works either. By the way, just look at the, the, the track record of the EU. You can see that that doesn't really mitigate carbon emissions either. And what I'm suggesting to you, they know it. It's just good for their finance constituency, but it doesn't really have any effect. If you truly believe what I just suggested to you, you know, about this, uh, you know, people don't know, it's only the market. How will we finally arrive at the correct solution? The correct solution is allowing a bunch of entrepreneurs to do crazy science fiction things called geoengineering that will save us. Mm -hmm. And by the way, again, this isn't me talking. Do you know that um, Heritage has a separate section on uh, uh, markets for credits and a section on geoengineering? See, I mean, if they believed one, why would they have the other? Well, duh, because it's a long-term political process. These, each of these things perform a certain political function so the next thing can come online because it takes a lot more work to get that thing online, right? See, so it, they are talking about a kind of a pure market science that's going to save us from climate change. And of course, in the meantime, we just keep spewing carbon because that's just, it's fine with them. Yeah. Um, not sure I can make this a clear question, but um, I'm thinking that, um, I'm thinking about the market as like, like a giant Pac-Man. You're just <laughs> consuming, consuming. But what, what I'm thinking about is that um, 
This is the uh, Cathedral of Learning and the Humanities Department. This is the Literature Department. And I'm thinking about how the market, the way people develop this idea of the market, can totally subsume, like Pac-Man. Right. Uh, yeah. because, because the model of the most sort of complex structure that a literature professor might have would be a Keats poem or the Homer's, one of Homer's epics. But this market, to the extent that people believe in this market, it totally subsumes all those other things. So, so, no, the, it just, it so just, the humanities... It just validates them or invalidates them. I think that's it, the way they think it, about it. It what? Validates them or invalidates them. It doesn't, you know, maybe it even helps produce them too. See, that's the way they think of it. But if, so the market, just, if the market is a, is a structure, is a more is a more capable of consuming everything. Then you keep saying consuming. I would I would ask you not to say that because they that's actually not a term of theirs. Well, the, they don't talk about that. What they talk about is they talk about this them. this innovation and then they talk about this they validation and so forth about stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, you see, yeah. so that's the way that they would talk about the poem too. I would think. But it, so that, but this market is so capacious. Yeah. That it, no. it really is more powerful than any poem you could ever come up with. Oh yes, you said. Yeah, no, yeah. the, 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 the truth, not as the truth that it knows, is beyond any truth in any artifact. Leonardo's got nothing on this market. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, but Leonardo isn't. See, I mean, they also think of it as he is a cultural manifestation of the market. So, see, that, so that's how they think of pan, pan market. <laughs> well, anything that's civilization. Is, comes out of this market validation process. I'm just reporting here. Okay, I'm just talking, you know, this is this is how it works. Okay, for them. Yeah. Just a quick comment and then a question. A quick comment is on the Christianity piece. And it would seem to me that the solution there, both given the theory you've outlined and given what I observe in practice, is that there is a line of Christianity, the Calvinist descended line that views freedom precisely as complete submission to the will of God. Yeah. Right? So then you naturalize the market and make it all-knowing, and there's a perfect consistency. And it seems well, this to be begins to sound like Weber a little bit. Well, I mean, but, but it's also and I don't, I don't know that they buy that. See, I mean, that's the thing. I'm, I'm not against have, it or anything. They just have to buy it to use that to reconcile the problem. And that gets me to the question, which is a, a version of the question from the gentleman to my, to my left earlier. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the view as you presented it is ambiguous between two possible epistemological constructs on the behalf of the neoliberals themselves. And I'm curious why you view it as one when the other one seems to lend itself better to your story. Let me explain. All right. One version of this epistemological framework is Plato's noble law. There are those who know, we right. have to tell the others right. the right. story right. for yes. their own good, and we'll act like we believe right. it too, right. but ultimately we know. Right. The other version is somehow we interpolate ourselves into the story that we're telling others, and that's the whole version of what well, we just happen to be able to see the market and see its wisdom, and so it's our job to make the market right. sort of work. Yeah. The former version, which I took to be what you were suggesting, is much more consistent with the logic that you've laid out for us in terms yes. of the duplicity, in right. terms of right. you know, some network version of agency and whatever. Yes. Versus this other like self-interpolating version, which just does seem to me to run precisely into the problem of contradiction that you were pointing out earlier. So I'm curious why, if that characterization of two possible yep. versions of your story is available to you, why you seem to want to opt against the noble lie version and for this other version. And so, so maybe there's something more, or maybe you. No, I, do, I, I look. I, I perfectly understand your distinction. Yeah. All right. And I myself hop between the two. I accept that as well. Um, and I think the reason I do that is because I want to play up their own contradictions to a certain extent. And so the noble lie thing becomes a way in which, well, they live with it. But also, you know, I did point out some people who are sort of arguing it too. So it's not like I imagine this or anything. But I also think that, you know, once this starts to become a real political project, it's huge and you got all these, you know, not all these people are going to be, you know, <laughs> philosopher kings or anything like that. So what you do is then you develop this kind of internally consistent version that, you know, they are just expressions of the market themselves and, 
you know. Um, yeah, but that's all just for public consumption. Well, but because of their problem, but see, the problem, the problem always gets shifted somewhere else because of the problem of freedom, right? You see? So, you know, one way to kind of seem, seemingly not deal with the problem of freedom is to move from the, the uh, 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 noble lie to the, you know, internal self-adjudication of the market, I guess that's what you would call the other one. Okay. See, I mean, they, could, they move back and forth between them, I think, themselves. And you can't see the contradictions as easily with the internally consistent market one. Okay. Yeah. Um. Inspired by your book, I started reading Hayek and have checked out, you know, the, these little um, kind of collections from the 70s as well as some of the major books. Yep. And I think reading him really answers the question that people are um, kind of flipping around in a kind of antagonistic way. <laughs> he does sound convincing that he has um, invented an internal logic whereby you can both be an intellectual and dismiss intellectual activity. Yeah, yeah, see, that's his that problem. Organize right. human life. Right. Um, and so my question for you is actually about Hayek's work and a comment that you made earlier. Um, I'm reading The Fatal Conceit, which his last book... Oh, yeah, which, Fatal Conceit. Which I'm hearing People that say that he didn't really write it, and all of a sudden, you know, there's all this problem with interpretation. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on whether or not that's kind of his final word. And I was also curious about, you said earlier that I reverses twice in his career yes. Um, yeah. on whether or not the market is all-knowing. And I was wondering if you could No, not the all-knowing, but, but um, what information is. That's what he reverses on. I was See, that's weird. You would mm, okay, that. yeah, really quick, okay. Um, new book coming out from Oxford, if you want to hear the story in, in any detail. Yeah, um, it's called The Knowledge We Have Lost in Information. Um, and uh, first, yeah, it was a, I think you quoted it, it's like there's, a, uh, or Coase, Co somebody quote, quoted Coase. The first version is, knowledge is this local thing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, you know, you have trouble, other people have trouble picking it up, but you know, I'm near it, so I kind of have it. And the problem is that, you know, all these things are local, so how do they get from the people who, have, who know it to the people who need to know it, something. Sort of that would be the first version. Second version is when he starts really thinking about psychology. See, because that's a very thing-like notion of information. And he starts thinking about psychology and writes the, what's the name of the psychology book he writes? Really weird, uh, 52, and I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the title, but anyway. He writes a psychology book. And there, the story starts happening that not only does his knowledge kind of, you know, laying around kind of inaccessible, but much knowledge is inaccessible to the human being themselves. <laughs> that he has a model of mind where you can't really, through contemplation, know what you know. Whoa! Okay, so that's a you know, that's a different scene altogether, and you got to change your, the rest of your story too, which he does. So, okay, and then we get to the late papers, competition as a discovery procedure, and so forth and so on. I would argue that by the time you get there. It doesn't matter what people know. That there are things that can only be known by the market. So you can go on and on about whatever knowledge people think they have. It really doesn't matter. And by the way, that hard edge version is in Fatal Conceit, too. He actually says in Fatal Conceit, I didn't really know what I was talking about until I wrote the competition as, as a discovery paper. Hmm. See? So even he can't keep on the same page about what is information, what it can be known, and so forth and so on. But you know, your average Hayekian, they don't give a shit, you know, they all think that, no, it's just the market knows and that's fine, and blah, blah, you know, just rip with the basic story. Sort of thing. Chris? I, I wanted so to know. Oh, okay. okay, well, then this will be a long answer. <laughs> uh, and it's like this, the what is to be done, it's a version of the what is to be done question, because you know, in the Sanders campaign, we, we did get a sense that there was some political purchase to be had in, uh, in, in, in non-market spaces. I mean, in being perceived as an advocate for protector of, yeah. defender of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's say, commons, free, right. et cetera. Right. 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 And that has, and, and, and you know, there's also the, the surveys on support for health care, funding for education, et cetera. And this, this is this is not insubstantial. So right. I mean, so 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 Hayek 
uh, certainly thought this was going to be a hard sell. He wrote this many times, you know, to get this vision across was going to yeah. take no, some time. No, it was the long game. That's right. But, it was, but, um, yeah. but on the political, you know, uh, on, on the political side, um, do you see any limitations or uh, oh, that, or tactical issues yeah. on this front? And yeah, I do, so actually. Can you, can you I think that when that? you say, oh, well, really, we want a protected sphere that's not the market, you, you, you give them too much. You give them this kind of um, uh, uh, unicity of the market and this monolithic, monolithic thing of the market. And so what we just want, I mean, what you're doing, I think, when you do that, is you, you're wishing to go back to classical liberal. And it's just, maybe, but, you know, it, it, that has been so thoroughly wiped out as by these trying, guys a, in a weird sort of way. Yeah, so that's right. Well, maybe. But see, I, I, all I want to say is that, you know, either you're, you're allowing them that the market is this amazingly powerful, unified thing, and you don't want to do that, it seems to me. That's a mistake. Or you're saying that, well, you know, liberalism is the, the night watchman state with a special sphere for the non-market, the civil society, and so on and so on. And see, I mean, they crushed that, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that the, there are a couple things they wanted to crush. Yeah, they wanted to crush socialists, and they wanted to crush classical liberals. And I think they were pretty successful. I know, that's not very happy, but, but it is what makes me worry about this, this whole... This kind of Michael, what's his name thing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.